Okay. I think we're gonna get started. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm not sure if you can see me because I don't understand the Zoom thing. Okay, but isn't that on? Okay, beautiful. Hi, everyone. Um, hello, welcome, welcome um, to our panel discussion on African immigrants and voting, um, and just talking a bit about our own experience, also about the importance of voting, but most importantly, the issues that hold that we hold dear um, to our heart and um, action items in which what we can do um, in order to create the world that we want to live in. I genuinely believe that we have the uh, power to do so. Um, Octavia E. Butler allowed me to believe that. And um, so tonight we will get started. And before I introduce our amazing guest, um, I want to open up with um, a welcome and uh, my name is Jija. I am a part of uh, these three beautiful organizations here that you have uh, that is listed on here. So the New England Black Stars, uh, the Ghana Association of Greater Boston, and also Afri America One. Um, and so we will, I want to start off by just kind of inviting a representative of each organization to just talk a little bit about the organization um, and where it's based and also its mission. So um, between Marlin, um, Aquisi and um, Evelyn, whoever wants to go first. I'm happy to go. Beautiful. Hi, this is Evelyn Abaya Isa, and on behalf of the GB, the Ghana Association of Greater Boston, um, we're happy to be partnering with the New England Black Stars and the African American Culture Initiative to put together this fantastic event to rally out the votes um, next week. Um, this week, this week actually, I'm saying next week. This, this Tuesday, um, this is an important civic event for our community and we need to get the message out there for people to get out there and vote. So GAGB is a membership organization that's open to all Ghanaians and friends of Ghana. And I would love to have anyone that is not a part of GHGB to sign up with us. We've been around for close to 30 years. I believe we'll be 30 years, um, 2021 March. And um, we are committed to advancing the Ghanaian culture and um, be there for a Ghanaian um, community in the greater Boston area. So not only in the greater Boston area, but all of New England. And we're open, when GAGB started, it was more focused on the greater Boston area, but we're expanding our wings to fold in anyone that is around the New England area and beyond that is interested in joining us. So I'll leave it there and let um, Marlon and the rest speak about their organizations and we get this program started. Thank you all and nice to meet everyone. Marlon, okay, you can hi. go ahead because I got to make a quizzy a panelist. Okay, no problem. Um, thank you very much um, for that lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Marlon Solomon. I'm the president of the Afro-American Culture Initiative. Our mission is to build cultural bridges in the African diaspora with education, technology, and travel. Um, we are the host of this um, event. We do a lot of webinars. We are um, opening up our online African Diaspora Cultural Education School in, um, online is an online school and uh, we're opening that up in January. It's called the Afro-American Academic Academy. So we do a lot of um, educational programming. Um, in fact, I'm doing, um, I'm doing uh, quite a few and I'll let you guys know about that a bit later, but we are doing one about webinars. So if anybody wants to host a webinar, 
we are having a um, an event to um, teach people how to host these kind of webinars. So um, that'll be all for now. And I can't wait to get started on this um, very important topic. Um, voting, as we know, is um, very crucial. Um, African immigrants, especially um, nowadays with what's going on with um, the, the hijacking of the Republican Party. I don't even call it the Republican Party because obviously they are not, that's not the Republican Party, that's the Tea Party. <laughs> and uh, they are, you know, they are very racially motivated and therefore as African uh, immigrants, we have to, um, we have to um, make sure we're being able to identify the issues that affect us. And I hope that we can get discussion started soon. Yeah. Have you made anybody the panelist? Or do you need me so, to I don't even know what I'm doing over here. Um, so who do you want to make the, somebody's oh, as an attendee? George, George, make him a panelist. George Bayok, okay. All right, you've been promoted. All right. George, you could, okay. Okay. Hello guys, how are you guys doing? I'm representing New England Black Stars. Uh, our organization is started by six people, which we started last year. Uh, we partnered up with you guys for this African immigrant vote and what we're, what our main focus and our mission of our program when we first started is, is to get um, Ghanaian youth and Ghanaian people together to offer them resources, mental health, and to throw, um, to um, have things, events for them. And also to put ourselves out there that, um, you know, we're here to help the community. We're here to help our Ghanaian community. We, we work in Worcester as well as Boston. Um, and that's the gist of it currently. COVID has slowed us down a little bit, but um, we're trying to find innovative ways to keep going and um, keep working. <clears throat> all right, thank you um, to all three of you guys for sharing um, about the organization. Um, it is an honor to have all of you guys here and an honor for all of you guys to um, share um, a bit about what your organization is doing. And so tonight I like, like to start us off with a, um, a think piece. Um, and I ask that everyone closes their eyes um, just to be present in this very moment um, and just to sit in a moment and what our intention is to walk out of here with this um, conversation and what we're trying to do. Um, most importantly, what is it that um, we want to walk away with and what are we going to put into action? In past US general elections, about 60% of the eligible population voted. And while this may be the year that changes, it's been shown that the democracy is suffering globally. The total declines, not just in participatory voting, but in political rights and civil liberties. This leaves us wondering, do we truly yearn for a democracy? Our elections, our only avenue for de democratic participation? Are we voting for a better America? Or is this an illusion that has been ripped off the America we currently live in? My parents are immigrants who migrated to America when I was seven years old. For some of us, all we desired was a better opportunity for ourselves or for our children. We told ourselves that some issues don't concern us or that our time in this America is short. So our voice isn't needed. Yet we find ourselves here exploring, wondering, questioning or ignoring, but we're here nonetheless. Tonight, this isn't a debate nor an opportunity to showcase knowledge on a scale of Western philosophy. However, this is a conversation that takes the care to black bodies at heart, that privatizes our needs and honors our descendants that follow us. I'm excited to see the issues that we hold dear to our heart and the resolutions in which we create now and in the future. To dreaming of a world in which we can exist freely. Whatever takes place on Tuesday, Wednesday, we still will be reminded that, there will still be, that we are still in the middle of a pandemic, that there are kids who are separated from their parents. Black people are still fighting for their lives and there's so many more to mention, but there are going to be joyous moments where laughter is shared, 
graduations, policy may even get passed, birthdays and all forms of joy. So let this be a reminder that we are advocates for ourselves, that our voices are needed to be shared, that we also have a right to, to create the world we want to live in, that we have a voice in that, that there is work that needs to be done in our neighborhoods, that we are actively fighting in our jobs, our homes, our minds, and it doesn't always have to be that way, but sometimes we choose because we believe in better. And I'll leave you with this African proverb, um, which says that you must attend to your business with the vendor in the market and not to the noise of the market. So the question I leave you with is, are you tending to the noise or are you tending to the vendor? In other words, are you tending to the people? I'm really honored, and you can open your eyes now. Um, I'm really honored to have this guest um, tonight. Um, I will add that this was done very much so last minute. I think we all found an urgency to really have this space in which we are able to explore this topic and really dig into what, what it is that we really want in a leadership, um, not only on a national level, but also in our own local cities and towns. And so we have a very diverse amount of group here before you. Um, and I'm gonna ask Marlon that we become the face instead of the flyer. So I'll make that happen. Um, and while he's doing that, beautiful. Um, if we could take George, George off, that'd be great. Um, so I'll introduce our panel. We have Marlon Solomon who is a legal specialist with more than 10 years of experience in immigration, labor, and civil law. Um, he is also the uh, co-founder of Afri America One. Um, and he is someone who I truly admire. His wisdom um, is beyond many years and I truly love to just sit and listen to him, although he doesn't give me a choice. Um, when he is speaking, uh, but I'm very grateful to call him my friend and also glad that he is on this panel discussion. And then we also have Michelle Martino, uh, which I had a pleasure of speaking to a couple of weeks ago, who is a legal specialist with more than 10 years of experience in immigration, labor, and civil law. Um, and she is someone who I think when we had conversation was really passionate about our own stories um, and who is also a writer. And so I'm really honored and excited to see what she presents to us um, tonight. We have a youth here, youth activist by the name of Daryl Mensa. Um, he is a student at the University of Rhode Island and he is studying biotechnology and marine affairs. Um, and he worked at the Mass Higher Greater Brockton Youth Works um, to help promoting to help promote voting in the area. Um, so I'm really honored and really excited to see, um, or to hear rather the voice or rather what he's going to be talking about from a youth perspective. Um, Cause I think that's also important. Um, Leonard is not here. And we have Daniel Oyolu, um, who I've had the pleasure of meeting a couple of times as well. He is a JD candidate at Harvard Law School and an affiliate at the Berkman Klan Center uh, Center for Internet and Society at Harvard, where he researched technology and development in Africa. He majored in Spanish at Bates College and has also studied in Cuba, Spain, and Brazil. Prior to law school, he worked at uh, he worked on Congresswoman Ayanna Presley's historic campaign. He has previously served on the executive board's board of Umu Ibo Unite, Boston chapter in the Harvard African Law Association. So I'm really honored that you're here, brother. Um, we also have Daniel Jima. Am I saying that correctly? Nod your head, okay. No. That's right. Okay, so he's from Timagana who grew up in Worcester, Massachusetts, graduated from UMass Lowell, and he is currently working as a consultant in the DMV area. And then we have our moderator, Nkira OB, excuse me, um, who I've had the pleasure of growing up with, um, and she is the host of Conversations from the Diaspora, a building Africa future podcast. She is dedicated to sharing stories from the African pers perspective, from the millennial experience, and Kira has worked in a variety of educational capacities and enjoys serving others by providing opportunities for educational and personal growth. And Kira is a global affairs scholar and hopes to start a nonprofit in the near future. And we also have Clifford, 
who is not, oh yeah, here you go. Clifford, who uh, came on very much so last minute. So I'm really honored that you came on and I'm currently trying to find your bio here. Um, he is a student at Howard, an office, uh, office coordinator at the USA for the UN Refugee Agency. And he's a second year PhD student at Howard University studying history. Um, so I'm really honored that all of you guys are on here. I'm really excited about where the conversation goes. Um, I'm not sure what happened to Lennar, but I think he logged off. So you guys have the floor. So well, I'm here. Yeah, it was his connection. I'm back. Can you guys hear me? We can hear you, but we cannot. OK, we can't see you. I forgot because your thing is off, right? Yeah. I'm about to... Okay, well, let me introduce you. I've had the pleasure of meeting Leonard. Um, I've met him a couple of times in the city. Um, he is born in Congo, um, and he is a dynamic Congolese American poet, speaker, and African diaspora consultant. Um, he is also uh, the founder and the organizer for the African Festival in Boston, which I have so luckily been a part of, and I'm so honored that you are here as well. So you guys have the floor, take it away, um, and I'm really honored to hear what you guys have to say. And just um, so everyone is aware, if you have any questions, there is a question box that you can ask questions in. Um, at the end of the panel, we will have a chance to interact with everyone and everyone will be able to ask questions. So. Thank you, take it away. All right, can everyone hear me? So um, thank you again for this uh, wonderful opportunity to um, be a moderator for this event. I know it's extremely important and very timely considering that election is literally around the corner. So um, I know most of it, we've just been introduced, but a lot of us are coming from different backgrounds. Maybe some were born back home, born in Africa. Some came as, you know, tender age of, you know, whatever, um, under 10 or whatever age you came, some came as teenagers or adults. Um, so could everyone just kind of briefly, you know, our panelists, could you briefly just tell a few things about yourself outside of what was introduced, um, you know, where your family's from and what work you're doing without, you know, reiterating, but just anything that you might want to share outside of the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, um, good evening. It's an honor to be a part of this panel tonight. Um, me personally, I was born in America, but both of my parents came from Ghana, and I know they came here to get to provide for me and help me to have the best life possible. But as we've been in this country throughout my whole life, something that we've seen is that it's, it's never easy for African Americans, no matter what we do. We come here to have um, educational opportunities, but as we're here too, we face we face systematic oppression, systematic racism. They they, they, they show racism to us in subtle ways as well, but they, they think they're gonna we'll notice it, but we do. One thing that is even clear to me, I just want to um, speak on this real quick, is that my school, for instance, is 71% white, 5% black. There's no way someone's telling me that 65% more whites are capable than African Americans. But that clearly shows you that from the bottom up, that there's problems that need to be addressed. Because there's children my age as well that they wanted to have those educational opportunities. But a roadblock arrived around, along the way, which is could be due to racism and discrimination that stopped them in their paths. Cause not everyone has um, the building block that I was blessed to have to stop me from becoming the stereotype that they want me to be. They look at us and they assume that we can only be thugs and we can only be athletes. We can be more than that. So by voting, we can make sure that we bring in someone who, who can give us the best opportunities for us to succeed. Because many of us have the knowledge to do something more than what, what they believe we can, but we're always oppressed. So we need to make sure that we're making a difference in our community today. Thank you, Daryl. Anyone else would like to say something? Yes, I go because I actually have a hard stop here. Uh, uh, seven. Definitely want to thank everybody, but uh, for me, um, originally born from Congo, um, DRC. That's Francophone Africa, right? So migrated with my family here in Boston at the age of sixteen. Went to multicultural high school in Boston, and and, um, and I was told that I was better than African American students. I was very confused about that statement. I was told this in high school and me coming from the continent from Congo, didn't know English because in Congo, we don't speak English, right? So I was very confused going to different emotions in terms of where do I fit in? I was very thirsty to understand, you know, black America life, um, all that sort. Went to Fisk University, HBCU, really was on a mission to um, kind of learn more about the black experience in America, but I was also very angry, frustrated, and, um, and I used my anger 
to, you know, to become a poet, um, doing consulting, community building, and advocacy for like 15 years. Um, because this topic, all this conversation is very triggering for me in a sense where I got involved into the voting process, civic engagement, you know, really learning that um, my anger came from the fact that, you know, there's no voices, you know, especially for somebody from Congo, uh, include all the many African immigrant, right? So it was sort of like you, you, you learning English, you, you, you learning you're welcome to America, all that, you know, not the movie with Eddie Murphy, but the real deal, because in Congo, <laughs> it's, it's totally different story what we saw on TV. And fast forward, man, it was just my realization that, you know, too, too, too much, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Disconnected, right? Um, and then realizing that like, wow, you know, here we are migrating here um, since the 60s and <laughs> we now known as African and diaspora, but so many of us, so many group are out there disconnected doing their own thing. Although we have made a lot of progress, but I think I look back at my personal experience, I can definitely say that if it was not, you know, the foundation of my own family, my own intellect, you know, because I was so angry and just heard the fact that people have so many misconceptions of Africa over as a continent. I look back to when I was younger and growing. And then the Congo, that's a whole nother conversation because my I was on a mission to really uh, teach people about, you know, Congo matter to the world because, because of the conflict uh, mineral. So I got involved in a lot of advocacy, you know, with the state, so many official, and just learn a lot, man. You know, I just definitely want to say that this is an important conversation. I think that at the end of the day, we have to be able, based on all my expertise and experience over the years, and, uh, and I just learned that we have to do a better job to keep pushing, um, make, make our people, right, uh, immigrating African community, that the benefit, the benefit of voting, you know, understanding that becoming a citizen, it comes to a lot of, you know, benefit as well, you know, have a strategy to engage elected official, um, build connection, you know, just talk about the issue that, that mattered to you and to your family and to your community. And by doing that, you learn that through the voting process, you build connection, right? Um, you get involved into engaging so many um, civic leader engagement. And that's what happened to me because I was in so many spaces, learn how to strategize and realizing that, you know, in Massachusetts, we do have the numbers. We, we have the number, we are, are here, but, you know, I think that we can always do a better job to make sure we educate different generation my generation, because I'm old school. I mean, I've done this, I've been there. I think um, I really support you guys having this conversation. I've learned so many things over the years that, you know, you just have to keep connecting, you know, whether the students, uh, the church leaders in our community, uh, you have to be out there visible because we're not visible as we should. Uh, we don't have a voice like that as we should. You know, you look at the state house up there, Beacon Street, um, Everybody have their own advocacy day. We rarely have one. I mean, you know, yes, we have had Africa Day advocacy in the past day, but um, so I just want to say that it's important just to educate to create awareness. Um, yeah, I'll just stop there. Maybe I'll jump in later. Thank you for that. Hi. Um, so uh, thank you for Daryl and Leonard. My my experience blend a little bit both of their experience. So I'm a first generation French citizen. So my parents immigrate from um, Cameroon, so not really from Cameroon. My, my story is a bit, in fact, they immigrate from Japan <laughs> to France. Uh, yeah, I have a little bit funny story to France. Um, so I grew up in Paris and um, so I didn't have the, I have a little bit of their role in the sense that I, I was an African I lived in Paris in the Western, uh, so in the, not the posh Paris, at the time it was supposed to be more like blue collar Paris, um, but not poor. But during all my, from in elementary school and middle school, there were only two black people, my, me and my brother, you know. So let's say to summarize that uh, some kind of frustration and things like that, I, I encountered them like Leonard, Leonard and Daryl said, the thing is that being an adult at some point, I was like, you know what? Um, I need to go where the opportunity are. So I came in the US as an immigrant. I was more than 30. So it was really in order to reclaim my life, to know who I was as a black woman, as a French woman. And despite the fact that Trump has already been elected to be like, okay, I'm arriving. 
I know what I'm up against, but I want to be able to be in a society where I know that I have opportunities, unfortunately. So, um, so that's a little bit of my story. Why I'm interested in what you're doing right now is that I think that for people here who have the citizenship and they really need to vote because I think that a lot of time, because there is a struggle being an African in America or a black person in America, whatever the African descent, they often forget about, not they, don't, they, do, they forget about the struggle, but this election has a big impact on all lives as immigrants because the immigration as your parents knew, as you knew or something like that will disappear with this administration. You have a lot of people right now who are African immigrants even if they are working, they are not on student visa anymore. Even the student visa, at some point he, start, he, he wanted to cancel it. So this election is really important because in addition to democracy and things like that, it's also what is the art of the US, a land of opportunities, what it will become. So I can speak more, but two minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we're just trying to be mindful of time. Um, Barlin, could you say something? Oh, you're on mute. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, um, see. Um, well, first of all, I'm probably one of the older members. See the gray hair. So I have had the um, advantage of probably being almost double some of you people's um, um, age. So I've actually seen, and when I think back to the 90s, when I was your age, America was a very different place. So I want you to understand, firstly, that when you vote, Whatever you're voting of, whatever you're voting for, trust me, is when you're my age, you're gonna see them the 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 you know uh, when I'm mid-40s, you're gonna see the difference. It's not for now. And that a reason why I say that is because sometimes I feel young people expect that oh, we're gonna to vote today and then the changes are gonna to come tomorrow. And it does not work like that at all. When I was your age, um, we're all in Massachusetts, marijuana was illegal. You, I mean, the idea that you could walk into a store and just buy marijuana is madness when I was growing up. Um, gay marriage, I mean, even to say gay, they were, well, what, what was the policy? Ask, but don't tell. That's where we were. And I'm, I mean, I'm still fresh, so don't get me wrong, you know? I'm not that old. And you need to understand that because therefore you understand that these changes are not, they're going to come. It's not like you have to wait until a million years, but they're, they're, you know, they're different, you know, it's different. Now my background, um, I'm African-American. My mom is, well, my mom is African-American and my dad is Nigerian. I have a very funny story. I didn't become a Nigerian until 2006. I, grew, I was born in America. I had my Nigerian passport. I grew up in Nigeria from the time I was two years old and uh, I came here for college. Um, my experience, and I'm also, I went to Iowa State University. Um, I have a um, degree in civil engineering. I'm currently working, like I said, I have an online school and I'm doing some research with um, Northeastern University. Um, we are working on redlining. Um, and this is, this, is what is, this is the crux of what I wanted to say as African immigrants. We have to learn the history of the system. People say systemic racism and it's like a catchphrase. You know, you don't really understand. Like you see somebody getting shot in or in Dorchester and you say, oh my God, it's systemic racism. But what is the system? It's actually a system. And that means it has rules and regulations and people that are for it and people that are against it. If you don't know the history, then your vote is really a guess. And when you think of redlining and the, 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 the position of black people in, in America, Redlining to me, and my, that's why I'm doing the researching, is the, is the cornerstone of all systemic racism, land and land use, being able to control what land is there. So whether it's a hospital or whatever, I don't want to go to, I only have two um, minutes. But the idea is that if you really know the history of the Republican and the Democrats and really do the history, I mean, you're in somebody else's country and you're just going to take it for granted who, what they're showing you. You, will, you, you may be very surprised to see that what is going on in the Republican Party now is literally um, being taken over by occultist, racist, super KKK on steroids, part of the society. But you have to do the history. You have to read the history. 
know how what African Americans have gone through. So so and when you see the results, you will know why it's there. So the question what I'm just really pointing out is that you there's a lot of history on YouTube. It's no is right at the tip of your fingers where you can really learn about why things are the way they are. Because just um, let me tell you one short story before I go. When Fela, I don't know if any of you know Fela, he's a Nigerian cultural icon. When he went to England, is when he decided, is when he learned about racism. And that's what happened to most of us. When we're in Africa, we just think white people love us. But you know why? That's because there's two million of us there. You know, that's why they love us. But when we go there, he learned that when he was trying to find a room, the um the um they had it on there, no coloreds, no dogs. That's what drove the message home for him. All Pan-Africanism started when Africans left in the 30s, 40s, and 50s under government scholarships to come here, and they now received racism of the African-American, okay? So it's very important we understand the plight of the African-American. I want to say also big up to Ghana. Um, my, a lot of my work is going to be working in Ghana as you are the only country that recognizes the African diaspora in its true sense, African country, right? All right, go that's, ahead. That's powerful. Um, Clifford? Uh, hi, how are you guys doing today? Um, I guess mine's gonna be brief. Um, if I talk a little bit about myself or at least tell a little bit of the work I've done um, related to uh, movements and mobilizing. Um, <clears throat> and I know how important we talk about voting is, and I know the types of structural changes that we can affect with voting, but I think um, for me, what often gets lost is the work that needs to be done outside of the political system um, and the work that needs to continue in, in, in conjunction with voting. And so I think that um, the idea of mobilizing, the idea of grassroots movements, the idea of, 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 of vigilancy, right? Uh, after the voting, after the polls close. Um, this, the gentleman before me was talking about history. Um, Marlon, as he was talking about, and he's right. And if you, if you look at history, there has been no profound or transformative right, civil rights act or law um, implemented in any voting year or the next or a year after any election. Um, and so when you look at that, you, you realize that putting the people in power simply isn't enough, right? The platforms that people that people propagate while they're running oftentimes right, are neglected or suppressed to a degree once you enter um, the political system. Um, and so I think that to keep in mind that um, the vigilancy to require the people and hold them accountable constantly to, to, to consistently, consistently present and articulate a, a list of legible demands for them that happens and continues long outside um, the, the political structure long, out, long after the polls close is what is far more, far more transformative, transformative, transformational. And so I think for me, um, that's what I've tried to implement and incorporate into my, my ideology and my praxis is, is how we continue to, to agitate out and um, how we continue to, to build these movements and these coalitions, right? When we talk about immigration, when we talk about, um, we talk about him talk about land theft, we talk about human plunder, we talk about land dispossession. Right, and so we think about these things, and we think about the, the obscure ways that they continue to happen, um, and the ways that they've been re-engineered over time. And so, understanding the system, and understanding the history, and understanding how, right, whatever party it is—Republican, Democrat—have have really endeavored to create new ways to to dispossess our land, to dispossess our property, and even our person, our personhood, is what we really need to understand and continue to um, build off those. And when we can understand those, I think then we can present. The, a, a, a very, very legible um, list of demands to the people that we hold responsible um, to continue to to allow us to evolve in these spaces. And so, for me, that's that's what the, most of my work comes out. It comes out the people that are that are lost. It, it's in the prisons, worked in prisons. Um, we, we forget prison, right? We forget that incarcerated people are still citizens, um, and they're they, they're still human beings with with lives with. Um, desires with pain, with joy. And so a neglect, like these neglected portions of the population are ones that we often just um, kind of discard. Um, and so I think that those are the people, those are, those are the types of, of people and, and movements that I'm talking about. The, the, the people that are existing on the periphery, right? The periphery of society. Um, 
and we need to we need to incorporate them, incorporate their logics, their ideologies, their struggles into how we're also um, looking at voting and, and, and agitating for our change. And so I, I think that for me, that's that's where my a lot of work comes from is, is really um, the people operating on the periphery of society um, or the societal norms. And so continue to um, do that. And I hope we can have a robust discussion about this. Thank you so much. Um, Daniel Oyola. Um, I just want to thank all, you know, the organizers for bringing us all together. Um, it's a beautiful thing and so important, this specific conversation. I will also be brief. Um, I'm Nigerian, but both of my parents are Nigerian. I was actually born in Toronto. I grew up in Houston, Texas. And um, I've had the privilege of studying the African diaspora all over and even particularly like in, in Latin America and just being able to see the beauty of um, Black folk all over. Why this specific conversation around African immigrants is really important to me um, is because, you know, growing up and growing up in immigrant communities, um, I just didn't observe um, our communities being politically engaged and politically active. So what I mean by that is when, you know, a local, whether it's folks running for the school board or um, engaging with local represent, representatives, like if I ask them, hey, who, who represents you? Like, you know, have you ever gone and called them, knocked on their door and said, hey, I need you to do this for me. Um, and a lot of times our communities just honestly want to, you know, get a good education, get a good job, and that's it, and that's okay. Um, and maybe frustrated with the system, but there are other ways or ways to engage with it. Um, so to the extent that we can have these conversations mobilize, strategize, teach folks like, yes, you're frustrated. Here's how you advocate for you, your family, and your community to make a change. Um, I think it makes all of us better. Thank you. Daniel, um, G. Uh, what's up, everybody? Um, I'm Daniel Jima. Um, you know, most people call me G, but um, uh, I like to just I guess start off by saying I think it's very important to um, for for Africans, um, especially sub-Saharan sub Africans, to get an understanding of the political environment that we're in now. And I really appreciate um, this talk. Um, you know, I feel like 2020 has done a lot of exposure. It's a big expo expose on on absolutely every single thing, every single aspect of our lives from working from home to all the racism that's <clears throat> been kind of like undercover in, in America to, um, you know, even the way the way we, uh, we treat each other and all that. 2020 has, has been a true pandemic in the sense that, you know, all the problems that kind of have been hidden for a long time have been revealed. And race is a big, big topic. And I feel like that discussion needs to be had. Um, you know, coming from Ghana, um, you know, I don't know how, what kind of experience you, you, um, everybody else had with their parents or with their relatives or whoever they grew up with, but coming from Ghana to the United States, you know, our parents, well, let me, let me speak for myself, my parents, you know, they're very conservative, you know, Christian, and, you know, there's this whole Akata thing that, you know, we're taught in our, in our homes that, you know, Black people are bad, Black people are lazy and all that, and you grew up with that mindset. But if you don't do um, yourself the justice of reading and understanding how, you know, Black people in America got to where they are, you know, you continue with that mindset. So saying all that is, you know, I've really taken an interest in that topic as, uh, as far as, um, you know, um, um, race, race um, history in America, just, just trying to understand and learning, learning about that. There's not, that's nothing I do in my professional life, but as, as a black person, that's something that affects me. Come from Ghana, I feel like that's a, something that affects me. So I, I want to do my best to try and educate a lot of, a lot of people. Again, like I said, you know, our parents had, uh, had it, my parents, at least my parents had a, 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 a different mindset of what black people are in this country. And I know some people who um, attended HBCUs. That, that was probably not an option for me growing up, you know, because of all the things I've been told about HBCUs. But now I, I tell people, what's the difference between, between going to an HBCU or going to, um, um, you know, 
tech in Ghana or going to a college in uh, Lagos or whatever, it's all going to be black people there too, right? So, you know, it's not, it's not a big deal. But these are things that, you know, you, you learn, you grow, you read, and you try to educate as much people as you can. And um, that's that's the kind of like, the I guess, the journey I'm on. I'm just trying to um, learn and also educate a lot of people that, you know, are in my circle and, and outside. So thank you. And I want to say shout out to Cliff. Um, I, I, Cliff is from Worcester. And I didn't know he was going to be on this on, on this panel, but uh, and I didn't even know you were in this area, Cliff. So it was good to see you, Cliff. Thank you all. So I mean, you all have said a lot of you know very impactful and powerful things. Again, we're all coming from um, different backgrounds. Some of us came again as adults or as little children, kind of growing up in this environment that we found ourselves in. Um, one of the main things that we always see is okay, like um, you know, oh well, these African Americans are different from us, which is a very unfortunate way of thinking. And I like the fact, um, you know, that as you mentioned, uh, Daniel, that 2020 has kind of revealed a lot of these things to us. You know, most of us are staying at home. So we have more time to kind of like look within and see all these things that are going on where a lot of us are being, becoming more active, you know, in the social space. So this year has really brought out a lot. And, you know, obviously we're having this discussion tonight. So with, um, with that in mind, um, we know that Black vote is essential and has historically been um, suppressed. So as members of the African diaspora, as children of immigrants or you know, of immigrant families, why is it important for us to use our voices and to exercise this right to vote in this election or any election? And what are some issues that may be of importance to us or more specifically to you? Anyone can um, open the floor. And remember, two minutes, please. I can take this one. Um, I touched on it a bit when I first spoke, but we're, we're, we're oppressed in like many different ways. Um, when you think about like the generation that have come before us, racism has literally been a problem like since we've been on this earth. You can think about people such as Emmett Till who were killed years ago. Then we have multiple killings this year for the same cause and basically nothing. So when I look at stuff like that, I look at we've been receiving brutality for so long and we, we, we cry out for change. They say they're gonna give us change, but they never do. So we have to come together in numbers to show them that we're serious. We have to come together in numbers and do what we can. We cannot, we cannot let someone else allow someone else to make, make this vote for us when our ancestors too weren't, weren't even given a privilege to vote. First, they didn't even allow us to vote. They didn't even allow us to vote at first, right? They, we weren't even allowed to be vote to vote. Then when we're allowed to vote, they still took it away in some manner by making us take literacy tests that white people would not have to take. As history goes on, like there's always repeated ways that they try, they, they try to oppress us, whether it be from busting the schools or um, discrimination or boycotts, there's always ways that they try to oppress us, but they, they do it in a different form and they say that things are changing. This is, this is what they have continued to do to us. So we have to come together in numbers to make change or else we're gonna be in the same cycle again. Cause they've shown for hundred more than a hundred years that they don't care about us unless we care for ourselves. So we have to make the decision ourselves and we have to make it a personal thing that if we do not stand up for ourselves, no one will. And that's that's the reality of the situation. Because our ancestors have been fighting for this. Your grandparents have been fighting for this. And we've received change, but we still haven't received full equality. As I've mentioned earlier, 71% of people in my school are white and 5% are black. There's no way that 60, more than 65% of white people are, are more capable than an African American student. But there's roadblocks along the way. Um, this was mentioned before I, before I wrap up. There's many incarcerated people that were put in jail for reasons that a white person will not be put in jail for. And now they're stuck in jail with all their desires. They have ideas that they want to bring to the table, but due to being put in prison for something that they may not have done, they're stuck in that situation and they're no longer able to reach their goals because they, they, want, to, they want us to be the thug. They want, that's what they want us to be. It's either we can be a thug or we're the athlete and we're putting money into their manager's pockets. We're more than that. So we have to come together and make change. If I may go, because uh, I have to leave at seven o'clock. This is very powerful. Um, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yes, I'm going to be brief. Definitely want to thank everybody here. This is what it's about, man. But it's, I'm going to put this in context and do the best I can in two minutes, you know, uh, regarding kind of like this whole conversation about as an African immigrant. Um, voting is important, man, to build strong connection. Us as African immigrant, we have to understand that. Uh, to build social connection, I mean, that's like your door to, to have a strategy when it comes to civic engagement, because we have to vote so we can have a voice and, and have a visibility, right? Um, 
we have to vote so our interests need to be heard because the reality is, is, is especially the state of Massachusetts. Let me put this in perspective. When we talk about low, we got at least 6,000 African community. I don't know if you guys know Gordon, the, the, the owner of um, the African Community Law and Center. Good people, man. I always talk to him. In Worcester, you know, you have a variety of groups and different sector in Boston area. And, and I know, I'm not sure I don't have the stat right, but over the years, man, there's over 100,000 African community here, here in Massachusetts. So the question is, you know, how do we come together to put our best interest forward and keep in mind of the young people. I'm always about the youth, the generation, because Africa has not only the most young people, but also when they migrate here, their voice matter. So we have to vote to make sure as interest of African immigrant regarding eco economic development, right? Where you are, if you're a college student, you're an entrepreneur, you wanna start your own business, um, you know, beyond that. Education and youth, health, public interest. Um, what else? Immigration policy, you know, that can allow us to create system to facilitate like businesses, you know, between like uh, people back home in here, right? And the state of Massachusetts, the city of Boston, Paris, they have uh, the, 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 the number wrong, the data wrong. I mean, you gotta understand that we have to educate themselves about our numbers, right? For them, when they're talking about African community, they tend to, to focus on specific group. I can tell you right now that Springfield, Mass, is a big community of people from Avery Coast who speak French, but don't have any voice. So the reality, whether you're disappointed about candidate and all that and don't trust um, folks, that's all right. But we got to be able to to vote as a way to, regardless of the outcome, you know, uh, the, the, we need an open door. Civic engagement is real, right? My, my ability over the years to engage with elected official got me a lot done, man. I was able to, 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 to myself and other Congolese leader to pass at least the Congo conflict mineral and really shout at Governor Baker, even Mayor Watch before they were mayor. Um, and then the youth, the millennium, man, they have a powerful voice. So I kind of want to leave people with a couple of strategies because at the end of it is this, you know, we got to be about execution all year long, right? We, we have to know that internally, we got to do better as a community, as a group, right? And we are, many of us are doing the work, people like Marlon and so many, right? We are out here, but we have to look thing, I think like Marlon, many of the guys say systematically, we have to educate ourselves. You have to look at things systematically, and then you have to look at things at the community level, you know? Gather all the African associations, you know, across the universities, right? Um, gather the church leaders, you know, the small business owner, have a system where at least um, to educate them about all the civic engagement stuff that we just talked about. And uh, because in the other part I wanna put into context is the fact that if I look back my experience, my go back and realize that, you know, look, at the end of the day, we know that all of us who migrate here, you know, from America and the US, you know, whether it was the 50 and the 60, we know that that's how we became known as the African and diaspora. We came as immigrant, whatever. But we didn't know, we didn't know about a lot of things. I don't think we didn't sit down. <laughs> people don't, people did not give us brochure about black history or discuss historical black colleges or, you know, we didn't know about what you call like the black massacre, all the Rosewood, the Tulsa, Chicago, all that. We didn't know. So I think that that's the disconnect first. And the other part that there's a lot of cultural barrier too. Um, there's a lot of African community, not only from the um, English and West African, like Ghana and Nigeria, because we know that traditionally speaking, they, they are number in the West, but there's other that's so ostracized that as we speak, they are, are here out there, but there's like no approach. So I think I want to give a shout out to definitely, you know, um, I love my, my people from Ghana and Nigeria, everybody, man, because for me over the years, it's funny how when I say internally, people could understand like, yo, Leonard, you, you over here organizing with the Kenyan, with the Uganda, you over any with everybody, trying to make people realize that, you know, we, we have to do this together. We have no choice, right? So I definitely want to thank you all, especially the young one, the million, you guys have the energy and we have to be in this together. And I want to challenge everybody to, regardless whether you vote or not, strategize that voting is your, your door in. I've spoken so many university, I've done so many engagement over the years of realizing that, you know, there's a disconnect, man, but we could do better, or we all do better. And then I wanna tell Priscilla that it start by doing today. So I'm gonna leave y'all with this proverb. I'm sure y'all know this proverb because I'm a poet. It's an African proverb that said, if you wanna go fast, go alone. If you wanna go far, you know, go together. Um, I got to go shout out. I'm going to pray for everybody, man. Just keep, keep using your talents. Uh, the, the gift that you have, uh, it's the gift to, to, to Ghana, the gift to Nigeria, the gift to Cameroon, wherever you're from. 
use it, use it, strategize, strategize, because at the local level, y'all, we can do so much, right? Just on the community level alone and partner with the students, partner with um, our church leaders, partner with the uh, electoral, and um, please get in contact with Gordon as a lawyer. And, uh, and, you know, I don't mind just folks following up with me because at this stage, I'm all about sharing information because it's not about me. And I just think that the more conversation we have, but we have to move beyond the conversation. We have to have execution plan. We need to have engagement, you know, all of the stuff that all you all do on the panel. Peace. Thank you. Thank you. That was beautiful. Um, can anyone else speak to? Yeah, uh, um, I wanted to say to pick a point about what Daniel Oyolu said. I really think that it's involvement. I really think that, you know, since the beginning, there's a sentence that often come and Daryl said to it's that, I think that a lot of our parents, when they arrive, whatever, wherever they arrive, they still get, they're still like, we are not hosts, we are welcome. So they, they still act as a guest, even though they get the citizenship, even though the children get the citizenship. So basically they do, they are polite, they do, you know, and the fact is that they do not get involved. And at the same point, at the same time, if you're at a guest house and it's cold, and you're not you're not comfortable with that. You're going to and you do not say anything, do not get involved, or things like that. Something's going to happen. The vote is really important, not just about the white sheet of Saturn that is on the White House, but the vote is important also on the local level. Because as Leonard said, or as Daniel said, who is your city council? If your Daryl was saying that five percent of the children are African. But if you do not care, he needs to have good grade. He needs to have a big, good job. He needs to be. But who is? At the same time, and often I said to people, especially in the US, that, oh, that's not the same for you. You're an immigrant or you're African. Do you really think that when somebody asks me for, if I have a French passport, sometimes they're like, oh, immigration is just for the Mexican. Eh, eh, eh. They're passing a law, and it's everybody that's in, in that. You know, a uh, Muslim ban is just for the Muslim. Muslim can be yellow, can be white, can be, you know, so really, it's really important to vote. It's really important also to us to be aware that we have a citizenship, that the US is, even if it's temporary, our home, the home of our children, where we are setting up. So we just not need to follow the law, follow the rule. We need to have an impact of those laws and those rules because all of our parents and every, even as individuals, we want a better life. And we cannot have a better life or a better thing if we keep quiet. And especially if we not participate and we have, we have the power to participate, even though the white people are doing all of the power in order to retrieve that from us. So yes, we need, I will say that involvement and let's divide and conquer will be good. That's a very good point, Michelle. I love the fact that you said that and um, Leonard too, I know he just left. I think it's important for us to do everything as a collective. It shouldn't just be, okay, me and my family, me, you know, my children. We have to think about all of us together because it's going to affect all of us in one way or the other. Our loved ones, you know, any family back home, if they want to come here, we have to think about them as well. Um, you know, just to be mindful of time, I'm going to go to the next question. Um, arguably, one can say that every election is an important election, but why do you all think that this election in particular is extremely important to us? And for those who didn't speak, um, please use this time. Um, I'll... Okay, go ahead, Daniel. Go, go ahead, Daniel. Okay. Uh, now, if you want, you want to go ahead, Marlon. Yeah, I mean, I think this this election is very important because I, I think somebody had already touched upon it. Um, the fact that um, I, I didn't, I don't even want to get into the politics of it yet because before we can you can even talk about this this current administration's policies, you get distracted by all these other things that happen, um, you know, in the news that we can't even talk about the policies. But the policies are there as well. But and I'm talking about, you know, the overt racism that we see. Um, I, I know that this country, um, racism is not, you know, racism is not kind of like rooted in dem uh, Democrats or Republicans, it's rooted in the United States. So it's, 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 not, it's not a partisan thing. Um, so, but, but um, 
but with this administration, the overt racism is so much that, you know, you have the president of the United States tweeting out videos of people, you know, shouting KKK, um, you know, you have the president given the opportunity to kind of like denounce white supremacy and he can't even say, he can't even say the name white supremacy, which, which, you know, but my point is, um, you could, you could feel the, um, the kind of like the MO of this administration, like what they really stand for. And then when you talk about the policies, I know somebody mentioned like the student, um, they try to, they, 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 they try to put a ban on, um, the student visas, um, you know, Harvard and Harvard and some of the Ivy Leagues end up suing him, suing the administration because they wanted to, um, kind of like use, um, uh, COVID and the fact that people, um, uh, taking virtual classes and all that to try and to try and uh, and keep certain um, immigrants out of this country, you know, and you have the whole Mexican border issue. So I think it's very important that everybody gets the bigger picture of what is going on, who they want to keep this country for, like they want to keep certain people out and make this country into just a um, kind of like a Caucasian country, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, so I, I feel like if if you don't if you don't go vote and if you don't see what is exactly what is going on these policies will be en enacted these things are going to affect you your family members i I'm, i work in i work in as like a, as an accountant um on the side when i'm not consulting and i do taxes and stuff like that and i've had a few clients come to me um you know churches and some non non for profit organizations come to me to do their um financial statements for them and what they do is they have to present these financial statements to lawyers to tell them that they can they can afford to keep certain um, immigrants in the country and and uh, kind of kind of um, pay for their upkeep and because their H one B visas have expired and you know so they can't you know they can't continue working at their current employer so they have to leave the country so what these uh, non for profit and churches do is they say hey this person could come work for us and here's our our, our financial statements to show that yes we could provide we make enough money to provide for this person so these are things that are affecting people's lives personally. So, you know, I think it's very important that you cast your vote. I know people will tell you, you know, neither of the candidates, you know, neither of the candidates are for, are for black people or are for immigrants, you know, they're both racist. But then again, you know, I think Marlon mentioned that you got to look at the facts, you got to go do your research, you got to go, um, uh, um, you know, go back and look, look at the facts before you just jump into this whole um, plain kind of both sides thing. Um, but that's, that's, that's what I got to say. Um, I'll hop in as well, and I, I want to talk about building off of that point that my amazing namesake Daniel just made, uh, but going further and talking about the things that are happening in this country and on the continent, there's that we have to we have to stay engaged like there's just no way around it, like period. Um, like right now, whether it's the six African countries that Trump has banned um, from getting travel like travel visas to the United States, those are still very much in effect whether it's um, African migrants who have come to this country and under an ICE detention and who have been fighting, um, um, fighting to be, um, to just to be free. And the government has just let them, left them in ICE. And like I know specifically there are Cameroonian migrants who have been gone on hunger strikes and advocating and exposing a lot of the atrocities that are happening currently. Um, and that goes silent. Right now, just in the past week, um, ten, the elections in Tanzania, elections in Guinea Conakry, elections in Ivory Coast, um, not free, not fair. Um, whether you talk about the NSARS movement in Nigeria and the government like, shooting at peaceful protesters, genocide in Congo, like there's so much happening. Our leaders back home may not respond to pressure inside the country, but they may very well respond to pressure from outside of the country. Um, pressure that we who are away, we in the diaspora are in the best position to drum up, to push, to push, to push, to push. So this is like, this is a really pivotal point um, because currently the, this current administration has engaged with Africa um, from at best a terrorism standpoint. So to the extent that it's a quote unquote um, security threat that oh, like Nigeria or Niger or whatever and their American interests um, which is a very one uh, myopic and limited view um, and doesn't allow for what could be a much better relationship and more opportunities for um, our brothers and sisters back home. So hoping that, you know, with the new administration, we speak up and say, well, then America should think about how 
um, America engages with um, our uh, the entire continent, to be honest, to put, put forward um, much more fruitful um, economic policies and things that can really benefit people and make sure that their voices are heard. First of all, I want to say I am just so impressed by um, the energy and the intelligence and um, the drive that I'm seeing in all of you. Um, and I know I have two minutes. I probably am going to go longer. Um, where do I want to start? Daniel made a very, very good point about the his parents' misperception, and that's what it is, is a misperception of the African-American plight. Um, an Afro-American, you know, my organization is called Afro-American Culture Initiative. You guys are Afro-Americans. You're like the perfect mix between total American culture, but you have a culture. Now, what your parents were describing, or at least they were doing their best to describe when they said African-Americans are lazy and this and that, they, of course, were describing the, diff you know, the difference in culture. That's what they don't understand. As being an African, you're full of culture and you take it for granted. And you do not understand that their culture has been systematically removed over 350 years, right? I mean, like literally 400 years of removal of culture. They can't, if you go to Brazil, you'll find slaves there. They have their culture. You go to Haiti, you'll find the Haiti there, have their culture. You go to Jamaica, they've made their own culture. So what is the difference? Why come Americans? don't have almost little or no African-American culture. If you go to the Boston Globe, I'm sure you guys have heard of the Boston Globe article in which they had um, African-Americans having a median um, income of $8, right? Then the white people have $257,000 per, per, that's the median wealth of their family. But there's another number that I found very interesting, which was the Haiti number. The Haiti number was 12,000. So what is it that is allowing the, the Haitians to be able to come from Haiti, they were slaves too, and automatically leapfrog? It, it was their ability to have land, to have their culture, when you, you cannot practice your culture on somebody else's land. That culture now makes you be able to have recipes like a goosey soup or jollof rice, which we all know Ghana, has the very inferior jollof rice. <laughs> and this jollof rice allows you to open up a restaurant, doesn't it? Now, an African-American does not have that luxury to open up a restaurant because they don't have a traditional food. So that cultural gap is extremely important to know that, yes, we are equal to them as human beings but we are way more advanced. We have all the advantages as being African because we have not had our cultural souls broken. I'm gonna ask, if you don't mind, I want to give two minutes to Michelle to describe the program that we just did on Thursday because she is my African culture guide. I give away a free DNA test to African-Americans every year. And then they now find out where they're from. We've only had people come from Cameroon the Bamileke tribe and she is my culture guy. So she now has to be an, a bridge. And that's what you guys are. In my generation, there's only, I'm like the only one that thinks the way you guys think, right? Then in my father's generation, there's almost nobody. Everybody thinks like how Daniel was talking about, right? Everybody's like, ah, African-Americans, stay away from them. Although my dad married an African-American, so maybe I was special in that way. But each generation, you guys are the bridge. You guys are the ones that can connect the African Americans and the African and the, and the African immigrants. And why it's important is because we don't have the numbers to be political. We're only Africans, immigrants. How many of us are there? If you don't add, if we're not able to take the lead in Af in um, in in and, and lead the way to seventy percent of the black doctors in America, are Nigerian. If we can't lead the way because we are culturally intact, being able to act as a community, you have to understand, think of an African-American community. There's not been many. Do you, somebody mentioned the Tuscaloosa, Oklahoma destruction. That was them trying to have a community. They can't have a simple village. A simple village that all of us take for granted. They can't have it. They can have a ghetto, which where they are put there. So I'll let um, Michelle talk about that program just for a little bit 
just to understand because this voting is important because in 2045, we're gonna be the majority. Black and Hispanic people are gonna be the majority in this country. And as far as those people are concerned, we're, 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 we're primed as African immigrants to take the lead. And it's your generation that's gonna do it. Daniel looks very young. He's already talking about consulting and accounting and this and that. You think it's easy to get those things? It's because he saw it as a young man. He saw his father do it. He cannot do it by himself. Who is he? He's only one human being. He had to watch it from 5,000 know, people ahead. But go ahead, Michelle. Sorry, my Nigerian accent came out. My bad. <laughs> no, I, I, I don't think I have a lot to add. And Kirun must have a lot of things to, to say. But indeed, yeah, yeah. your program is really important in the sense that you have that also that things that a lot of Americans now are, are interested to know where they come from and their DNA. So um, to be able to bridge with them and to embrace them. Um, I know that my role from being from the Bamileke tribe is really to help uh, some African American to know what is to be a Bamileke. But at the same time, I'm learning a lot about their history as African American uh, and to be able to be more involved here. I'm sorry, my phone was absent. But I will let uh, Kiru continue talking. Maybe we can talk later when there will be Q&A. Yes. So Thank you so much for the contributions. And I just want to make a very quick point because I think we'll be remiss not to um, talk about this. Um, the word tribe, I feel like it's one of those um, negative connotation words that you know Western or European powers kind of put on us. I think ethnic group or cultural group is a much more fitting because tribe has a very like minuscule kind of way of you know calling our people or saying this is our tribe. I just wanted to insert that because I know no, you know, no, no. To... Thank you. No, but you know, you, you also have to remember that I'm a French spoken and tribu in my language doesn't have because that's how we call ourselves also. And or I will say my village, if you prefer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So you are, um, we've touched on so many important things. Um, so if you yourself are unable to vote for whatever reason, um, what are some ways that you're encouraging others who are able to vote to do so? Um, so for me, for example, it has been a lot, um, and we can go back to what I was saying regarding Marlon um, to Afro-American. The fact is that I'm not allowed to vote, so I, my voice cannot be heard. So by voting, especially if you appreciate me, you helping me, you, you, it's some kind of proxy, I will say. So for example, I was taking that example that, um, so in 2017, there was the election in, in France after yours. And we have also alt-right who was supposed to come. So my brother and I are the only one who have the French citizenship. My mother didn't have the French citizenship. And so the candidate of the alt-right was like, everybody out. So basically we were joking with my mother that, okay, start packing your bag <laughs> because you're going back. And when we get the result, my brother called my mother was like, okay, you can unpack, you can stay, <laughs> you can stay, you're allowed to stay for. So I will say that for me, how I encourage is that I explain the situation. Um, Trump, uh, this administration, I put a lot of people. So let's say that, for example, in August, he decided that everybody was H1B, like Daniel Giama was saying, he was going to cancel the H1B, things like that. So the fact is that you appreciate me, you like me, the fact is that with this administration, I'm forced to leave. I'm forced to go back. My dream, my adventure in the US will be short lived or things like that. So by voting, you're voting not just for yourself, but you're voting also for me as a proxy because you're going to have an influence of, on me and about on a lot of people who are like me. So that's how I encourage them. Like not, do not just think about you, Think about also all over and the influence and the impact that you can have on other people. And those other can be your cousin because uh, the immigrants that are coming with this administration, no more immigrants, your future employer because Google and things like that without India, they cannot do anything or things like that. So the vote is not just, it's really something that it's a tribe. It's really the collective. So that's how usually I say to people, please go vote. Not just because I'm going to leave, uh, and again, I have that privilege. I have another passport. And we all here have a privilege because we have a, if tomorrow this guy, I'm like, bye, bitch. <laughs> but lots of african American doesn't have that things, you know. So it's really, it's how I tell them. It's more an empathy and compassionate things. 
that this policy is impacting people that you like. Um, I just wanted yeah. to jump in after that. Um, so I appreciate all the, all the, the discourse that we've had. Um, I think a couple of things have come to my mind as we've been um, engaging. And I think for me, the first thing I think I always say is the personal is political. And I think a lot of us forget that um, or might not truly engage with that, that idea that the person is political. Therefore, like we need to, we need to kind of reimagine for me, re reimagine the ways we center the power of our voice solely through the, the, the political system. And I think that if we can understand that, then we can also, we can, we have opportunities to extend and, and really build and really like build these large, large coalitions that are engaging with all the institutions, right? Because because the polls are, are one one form of the institution. That's one form of the American institution that can create that can create change. Although that is more gradual and incremental, because we understand all the me the mechanisms and the machinations behind the political parties and behind behind governance and how that how that's administered. Um, but I, I think for me, um, what I tell people is, even if you can't vote, everything you do with your with yourself, with your body, with your life is a statement. Right, is a statement to um, about something in opposition to something, and it might be resistance, it might be active resistance, in which I think a lot of the times, right, we can, we can kind of reimagine and reconceive ways that um, resistance plays a large role in in voting. And I think a lot of people don't like to talk about resistance because we think it's a, um, a lot of people kind of stigmatize it as 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 violence, right? And I think protest, and I think. Um, boycotting, I think those type of engagement opportunities are things that um, are part and parcel of the political process that extend beyond simply just going to the polls, right? And so if we understand the person is political, the way I wear my clothes, the way, right, the, the, the way I may wear my hair, um, the, the music I listen to, everything, it all has, it all has, it all is, is stating and, right, it's all suggesting, right, a, a, a philosophical stance philosophical school of thought that I may or may not have, that I can extend that into the, the, the polls. I can extend that beyond the polls and toward and, and how I engage and kind of have it shape and contour how we engage with, with different institutions, right, within the American, within the American um, colonial state. And so I think that those are a lot of things I hear that we lose our voices. And I, and I, I, I can understand, um, right, the, the tendency like that we might have to kind of, um, classify and qualify how the strength and the power behind our voices. But I think that we need to, to start to reimagine and broaden the ways we, we talk about our voices because you can be heard, even if you don't vote, you can be heard. Voting is one aspect of, of, of attempting to bring about change, but it's not the only aspect. And so I tell people, even if you can't vote, you still can be heard with how you move through this world, with the institutions you engage with, 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 right, right, with, with protests, with ad advocacy. And I think those are critical ways that will always will always impact the state, impact the political our political representatives, um, impact how the system, uh, how the structure continues to engage with us, continues to try and define us. If we help redefine it for ourselves, um, what our voices mean, right? And I think because I think of what I do is what I think of, of historically right, as a, as a training historian. But I think right I, when emancipation right and, and 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 black men were getting the right to vote. Um, and were included. Black women didn't have the right to vote, but Black women engaged with, right, and, and during Reconstruction, um, during, right, and right after the Civil War, Black women continually engaged and resisted and petitioned the system as much as they could with, with or without um, the ability to vote. Um, they utilized institutions like the Freedmen's Bureau to kind of uh, create and define and articulate their own visions of freedom, of, of womanhood, of personhood. And so, they understood that voting was one way for them of, of trying to attain power that wouldn't be accessible to them. But they continued to understand that outside of voting, we still have a responsibility. Uh, we still have, a, we have, we have the, the possibility to help define our lives by how we try and engage with these institutions continually, 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 right? We continually petition them whether or not we can vote. Our voices can still be heard as we continue to hold these institutions accountable um, and the ways that we're engaging with them. And so I think that that's what I imagine when we talk about um, continuing this, if there's people who can't vote, like what, what do we tell them? And I think even the ones that do vote, I tell them those, that same message is what I try and um, disseminate is that it's how we continue to engage with these institutions outside of the voting because our voices are not limited solely to the polls and 
there's a myriad of ways that our voices can be heard and continue to be heard um, and are, are legitimized. And so I think we legitimize our own voices. Don't, don't, don't require right, the, the, the US's decision, the US's the policy or, or, or psychology of if you are an eligible or legal voter to really determine whether or not your voice is powerful or if you have voice or if you have agency. You have agency regardless of if you vote or not. It's how you use that agency. And right, and, and that's what I think I try I try and help disseminate. Okay, um, thank you. So just a quick question that came in. Uh, let me just read it to you all. Well, actually kind of a number of questions, but let me just kind of target it to this one. Um, I think one of you mentioned this earlier um, as it relates to be being more engaged um, with what's going on, you know, both in this country and in our respective home countries. So what are some things that you have done in the past or, you know, with this election in particular to make yourself an informed voter and what would you encourage others to do? Daryl, could you please take that quickly? Yes, so um, this, this one I, I can quickly like go over. But me personally, like throughout the whole summer, like with COVID going on, a lot of people felt like they were limited and they, there's nothing they could do. Yes, there is something that you could do. You have Zoom, you have technology, your phone is very powerful. So me personally, and I'm very thankful for this, I worked with the YouthWorks of Brockton and we would constantly hold Zooms with many people from, from New England to inform them as why they should be voting and why it's important. And would make it clear to them the, the problems that they face as African-American people. And not only was this, this was all age ranges as well. So I was also convincing people who are not 18 yet that when they turn 18, that they should vote. Because I feel like sometimes the younger generation as well, they feel like, oh, I make my own money and I'm doing my own thing, I don't need to vote. They don't yet understand like how much they're affected. And also there's even adults too that feel like change cannot be done. Like it's the damage is too much. Like as long as we never give up and like, we see that there's power in numbers. There's a reason why there's, there's a reason why like they're, they keep oppressing us because they know what we can do. The, the, the black mind is powerful. They, they want to stop our potential because they know what we can do. So we have to keep fighting the fight. Like we have to keep, keep pushing because you, you in, in, in any way you can, there's always a way you can make a difference. Your phone is very powerful. Call your friends, call your family, tell them to go vote. And like Mr. Clifford was saying, it's not just voting. There's other things you can do as well. We can we can we can hold zooms in the community. We can hold zooms with various type of people, and try to target the people that don't understand why these things are important. Because I also have a class about anti-racism and supremacy. And the other day I'm sitting in class, I'm like, all this information is important. But at the end of the day, everyone who wants to take this class are people that already know that racism is wrong. So let's try to target people that don't really understand why racism is wrong. Let's try to target people that don't understand why discrimination is incorrect. Try to try to have those conversations that people aren't comfortable having, because we need to target those people that do not really understand why this is important. Because even at this meeting too, right? All of us here know that we should vote. All of us here know why voting is important, but we need to be able to reach those people that do not know why voting is important. So even in the future, when we're holding these type of zooms too, we can make it a point as well to publicize it more to get more people that maybe aren't from Ghana, maybe aren't from Nigeria, because we need to get those people that don't understand why this is important. So that's, that's a question that we can all ask ourselves is, have you been having those uncomfortable conversations? Have you been targeting people that um, don't, don't understand why voting is important? Have you been targeting people that don't feel like they have a problem with racism and discrimination? Those are all things that I feel like we should, we should take away with this meeting today and ask ourselves what we should, we're doing. And we can use our phones. We can make a difference in society as long as we, we always like, just stay confident and keep fighting the good fight. Thank you. Um... So one of the many unfortunate things that plagues um, elections in our respective homelands is, you know, this rigged election or other forms of corruption. And arguably, one can say that there's been issues with that here, especially as we saw, um, you know, the last 2016 election. But what would you say are some of these maybe differences that you see between elections in your home country and here? And I guess what would you see or how would you say, I guess, one or the other is more encouraging or how can you address that? Um, Daniel Yep, thank you for the easy, easy question. Um, no, uh, let's see. So some of the things that I think about are, I was having this conversation with a friend today. Um, uh, unfortunately for some, I mean, so there are 54 countries in Africa and you have, you have a range uh, as to what 
uh, the government's elections uh, and democracy does and does not look like. Um, I think for the countries where like the, the elections aren't free and fair, I think accountability is a really big part of that. Um, and that's really what it, it comes down to, right? So someone can alter uh, the results or persuade or influence them in a way that works for them. Um, and there isn't any um, backlash or there isn't any real um, threats to, to their power. I think something I've seen that gives me that I've appreciated more is like seeing more heads of state um, across Africa say, you know, for, cause something that's what's been happening a lot recently is um, heads of state saying, oh yeah, I've reached my term limit, but I'm going to change the constitution so I can run again because like I'm the best person for the job clearly. And um, it's been good to see folks speak out and say, even other heads of state be like, for you to do that, that's basically like an, a way, another coup, right? So even though it's not a violent coup, the Todd that we're, we're used to, but it, that is a way of holding the government hostage and saying, you know, this is the way that it must move forward. So even those having other heads of states and their peers speaking up, um, I think is um, a really, it's like, for me, that's a, a sign of progress. But we have a long way to go. Um, and it's, and it's, and it's, um, it is troubling. I think what's nice, what's, what's the bigger battle now will be the internet um, because activists are using the internet as a means of like disseminating and sharing what's going on in the country. And then when you see that the government decide, you know what, we're going to like shut down the internet or, you know, we're going to jam certain telecommunications. Um, you know, that makes things a lot tricky and trickier for the outside, whether it's us in the diaspora, whoever to um, lift those voices up. So uh, I know you didn't really ask this, but something I would just want everyone to keep in mind and to try to advocate for is um, just a free internet and making that more accessible to people um, and to governments back home. Like, you know, you can't do that. Um, we're watching and, you know, to what to the extent that we can figure out um, different methods for accountability. I think that's the way to, for strengthening the institutions. Daniel, that's an extremely powerful point as it relates to accountability. Thank you so much for saying that and the internet access, how we're all, kind of able to engage with different movements in our you know, respective home countries. Michelle, you brought up this point earlier and I'm really glad that you mentioned it. I think one issue that we have as African people um, from anywhere in the diaspora, including our African-American cousins, we're too like passive at times. Like things are, we allow things to happen to us and you know, we rarely see much of a resistance. You know, in our home countries, you know, on the continent, we have different governments kind of mistreating the people and we're just, like almost sitting there tolerating it. And even here, you know, uh, for those of us who are Im immigrants here, you know, in the diaspora here, we're kind of allowing things to go on, not really saying much, maybe talking our, amongst ourselves in our communities. You know, I think this um, year has kind of opened up a lot of our eyes and a lot of us are kind of speaking out and fighting back and doing different things. Um, Marlon, what, what can you say to that? Like, how can we truly use our voices um, in a way that is meaningful and um, to make the kind of change that we, demand that we desire and that we so much need? Thanks for that question. Um, but I think Daniel kind of already answered it. The world, these African countries, trust me, these guys are double my age. Huh? And I was able to watch DJ Switches. Did you guys follow that DJ Switches? Um, 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 I was there when they were moving the bullet from the person's leg in the middle of the ground in Lekki, and I know it was real. I was there with like this, and I was like, my heart, I mean, can you imagine I'm in Dallas because I was on vacation, and I, I, I was in Dallas, and I'm watching my phone, and I'm watching this. The answer is you guys have to really galvanize the internet and actually, be, you guys can, you guys can topple the federal government of Nigeria. They don't have nothing. Trust me, they don't even, the only reason why you won't be even be able to really really knock them off the planet is because they're they are still working with paper and Marlon, we can't hear you. I think we lost your audio. Marlon, we can't hear you. I know you're saying something really important, but we can't hear you. <laughs> Uh, 
Okay. So Marlon, we cannot hear you. <laughs> okay. Unfortunately, we cannot hear Marlon right now. I don't know if he can hear us. Um, I don't think he can hear us because it's like continue talking. Yes. Yeah. And now he's on, now he's muted. So I'm not sure it's going to. Okay. So Marlon, unfortunately, the good portion of what you were saying, we couldn't hear you. I don't know if you could hear us. Okay. All right. So Marlon, your line was on mute again. All right. Um, so just, you know, moving right along. So again, kind of using this idea or this um, topic of social media and um, our community groups. Um, so one thing that we often hear, and I think one of us has touched on this already, we often hear that our vote doesn't really matter or you know they're not going to vote for whatever reason so why do you think um personally that our votes or voting is important and what can you say to those who are skeptical for whatever reason and choose not to vote um clifford could you speak on that please oh, oh okay. uh, just quickly i will say okay. that to go back to marlon and a lot of people just remind story bush in 99 won by 503 537 votes, 537, that's it, <laughs> story is important. Thank you, Michelle. So Clifford, could you talk on that? Um, well, for me, first of all, I think we have to engage him critically. I mean, whoever it is. I, um, I think there's a tendency um, to dismiss people instantaneously when you hear them um, convey that they're not voting and not interested in voting or it's a waste of time. Um, and I think that tendency is like, is rooted in right, these, these ideologies of, of how much power um, is attached to voting, which is fine, which for whoever believes or, or disbelieves, to, it's up to them to believe or disbelieve how much power is attached to voting. Um, but I think that what we do, when we, when we, when we instantaneously right, dismiss them, I think we ally to miss critical opportunities, right? To, to, for discourse. And I think the discourse is, is powerful and necessary in how we start to redefine and reconceptualize our world and what we want our world to look like. And so I think that engaging them initially to understand, right, to internalize, to, to unpack what the reasonings are behind this, the, the decision for them, right, or whoever maybe to, to not vote or to not participate in the political process, because I think there's a, 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 a large group, there's very critical intellectual, right, thinkers and thoughtful people that don't vote or decide they don't vote. And if we if we automatically right qualify them as whatever we might qualify them as as an opposition to democracy, to our progress, to whatever it may be, um, I think we're doing ourselves a, a disservice. And I think that's intellectually dishonest for us to do. Um, so for me, it's always engaging. It's always a process of engaging um, for anybody to figure out what are the reasons why? What 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 because a lot, of, a lot of the times there's still activism going on. And I think we forget, we have a tendency to, to, right, to trivialize the impact of activism. So voting can be a, an expression of activist desire. Non-voting can also be one, right? And you can interpret that however you want. But also what happens outside, as I always say, outside the political arena is an opportunity, is activism. And so we have to engage. If these people are saying they're not voting, but they're still, right, traversing the, pro traversing this, their, their terrains, right? The different landscapes, the different institutions and in ways that are building, right? Advocacy, building coalitions, building, right? Um, support behind whatever projects that they're believing in. I think that that is something that as, 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 as citizens, as people who are, are engaged in this process of continual, right? Uh, uh, discourse and continual epistemology, like how we know what we know, continual um, garnishing of knowledge. I think that it's critical for us to do that. And I think that they can help us and help other people in their decisions in voting. Um, and maybe you can convince them or not convince them. Um, I just think that it's up to it's up to us to be thoughtful and be very very cognizant um, about how we're engaging different people and understanding and trying to learn the ideologies um, behind um, certain decisions. Because 
they're all rooted in, a, in, in right a multiplicity of experiences. They're all rooted in various subjective experiences that kind of contour and shape um, your own your own philosophy. And so I think that that's what we do. That's 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 a necessary that's a that's a necessary course of action for me is right that engagement process that I think oftentimes gets lost um, when we just when, if you hear someone say they're not voting. Thank you for that response, Clifford. And I, there's a you know powerful quote by the good brother Malcolm X. I want to paraphrase it. He says something along the lines of, um, you know, don't be so quick to I guess put down your fellow brother or sister for maybe not thinking as fast or coming to a certain conclusion because there was at one point where you you know weren't there. I know that was a terrible paraphrase, uh, you know, way of paraphrasing it. But it's important for us to, you know. A lot of us are, you know, I don't want to say ignorant, but a lot of us, you know, maybe they, we have different levels of understanding. We're coming from different um, backgrounds, schools of thought, um, different experiences. So it's important for us to engage, as you've mentioned, and um, do whatever you can to enlighten, and, you know, whatever it is that you've learned in your journey, be open and willing to share that because you're, you know, going to help someone else, someone else out in a wonderful and special way. So, you know, we are kind of short on time. So we're going to quickly go to some questions from the audience. Um, I think, let me see. Jija, are you coming in? Priscilla, are you coming in? Yeah, um, so if there are any questions um, in the audience for any of the panelists, um, you're more than welcome to either speak or put it in the chat box. And if there isn't any questions, which it looks like there isn't, um, or any comments that anyone wants to add, um, I'm going to ask the panelists to kind of give us a closing um, on anything that they want to kind of bring up, things that we should be aware about in our voting process, if we have already voted, some action items that we could do um, in our own communities. Um, but yeah, y'all have the floor. Oh, wait, Stephanie has a question, so think about your closing. Um, So Stephanie, you can um, unmute yourself, I believe. Okay. Um, thank you all for hosting this panel. Um, I think it was stated earlier, I guess, um, the, um, trying to find the word for it. Um, I guess like a little, a division, I don't know if division is the right word to say, um, between us and like African Americans, um, I think Michelle brought it up like a being a French citizen, like she can vote there versus here. So I, um, I guess that's my question, especially when a lot of the protests happen over the summer. Um, I'm in Rhode Island, so we had a lot. Even last week, two weeks ago, we had a protest because unfortunately, a young man, um, we had a moped incident and. Um, he lost control and there was a police officer following him. So there was an uproar literally last week. So we had protests up to this time. So I guess my question is, um, I went to some of the protests, but I guess the biggest thing is maybe in that divide, um, how can we, I guess, make that gap going forward, um, you know, for, I guess the elections or even engaging, um, I guess between us and, you know, black Americans, for example, or even, you know, second generation, first generation. So Stephanie, if um, the panelists would give me the opportunity, I would love to answer this question. Okay. So I think for me um, personally, um, one thing that, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, one thing we've seen in this year, um, as it relates to the Black Lives Matter movement, you know, other Kind of social movements that have come up, you know, as a result of you know us staying at home and um, different challenges going on in our world and our country. Um, we are in this country and we are very much part of the Black American experience, although coming from a different angle, from the you know African diaspora, you know, much more I guess a recent um, you know members of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is, if we are pulled over, the police aren't going to ask, what type of Black person are you? Right. So that's right. 
it's important for us to understand that although our experiences may be different from let's say a black American whose family has been here for generations, part of this experience as well. Um, and you know, our families, our future families are, you know, for those of us who have children or not, you know, they're going to grow up in this society. So it's best for us to understand it, um, kind of navigate it the best way that we can and try not to like create any unnecessary division. Cause you know, for those of us who grew up here, um, you know, came here as kids like myself, you know, a lot of these things are kind of, you know, growing up you're seeing or you hear, oh, you know, a lot of these negative African stereotypes. And of course it's easy for you to kind of uh, internalize that and then grow up with this maybe hatred or dislike or uh, overall, uh, you know, no interest in things that, that relate to, I guess, black Americans. But again, at the same time, you know, all these things kind of affect us in one way or the other. So it's important for us to unify and it's important for us to um, try to understand one another and work together. It's, it'll be better for us to work together in the long run than to continue to separate. And that, that same point goes for all of us on the continent. You know, it's not, it shouldn't just be oh, Nigeria only, Ghana only, uh, Liberia, Cameroon only. It's, you know, it should be all of us. You know, we should all work together. Um, and, uh, you know, all these divisions, we need to like really stop that because we can't move forward if we continue to divide ourselves. So, Does anyone know. else want to answer? Okay. Yeah, sorry. Does anyone else want to answer? Um, I think that everything that Kiru has said is real. Um, it's really the divide and divide and conquer. Um, unfortunately, I, I, the example that she took is really an example that I often say. When I'm controlled or something like that by a police officer, he doesn't care if I'm French. All he sees is a black woman. That's it. So I think that by the moment, um, every black person or African descent in the US understand that it's easier to move forward. That it's, I, I won't say that in that essence, all skin falls are kin falls when it comes to prejudice. And I'll just add real, real quick um, that there, I mean, there is a gap, but I also want to highlight the fact that um, there's been over history, lots and lots and lots of communication, dialogue, relationship between uh, the continent and the diaspora, um, whether, you know, it, the continent in Africans and like Black Americans, African Americans in the U.S., like, I mean, folks like MLK and Kwame Nkrumah were in dialogue. Um, Malcolm X took his trips out to Africa. Right. Patrice Lumumba was very much aware of the things happening in the civil rights movement at the time. Maya Angelou, like this, like there's a rich history uh, and we have to do um, a better job of bringing <laughs> that history um, and telling those stories because or else it seems like, you know, there's really no, there's no disconnect. There is no communication. But there really is, and and folks put in, um, you know, that's telling that story of how rich and beautiful it is to be black, uh, wherever we are and wherever we're coming from. So we have two more questions. So what I do ask is that when you ask your question, you have a person who you directly want to ask the question to. Um, so Nana, you can ask your question. I have a two-part question. Um, so a few days ago, I was on social media. Um, I don't know if you guys know the, um, the IG uh, page, Embracing Black Culture, um, but I was on there and I read this quote and I'll read it over to you all. Um, again, just a reminder, I have a two-part question. So all of y'all are out here wavering your Trump flags and your MAGA hats and your Confederate flags and Black Lives Splatter bumper stickers. And why do I have to press one for English apparel and all the other BS you are slinging? Just know this presidency end. It might be two months or God forbid another four years, but it will end. And your friends, family, coworkers, and acquaintances will never see you the same. Decency and kindness and respect for the next human being will reign again. But you have climbed out of your hole with your racism, bigotry, sexism, and willful ignorance, and you will not be able to climb back in. The side of history that you stand on will haunt you and your descendants for generations to come. Stand back, 
and stand by for this crap. So the question that like, when she mentions decency, kindness, and respect for the human, the next human reign again, and the notion of like people have climbed out of their hole, out of their racism, bigotry, sexism, willful ignorance, um, but will not be able to climb in. So like they're illustrating the, like the importance of valuing and respecting human life and existence and attributes the lack of it as a catalyst to covert racist, sexist, biggest to become overt. If a person is covert or overt, they, are they not still racist, sexist, and willfully ignorant? And may not, may, do they not just value human life? It doesn't really matter who's president for those people to come out and speak. I don't have anybody that I'm directing to, so anyone can kind of take that. Are you, so you're talking about um, basically like the different kinds of whether it's covert or overt um, racism, is that your question? So it's in terms of, so the reason why, um, and I've had a lot of discussion in terms of like the last recent months, right? The, con the country has been really been confronted with a lot of immense political instability and instability that I believe is intrinsically American. And, but the thing that oftentimes I'm hearing people say is that, you know, the need to restore a form of America. And then for me, the pose, the thing that comes up is there, is there a strong need and urge to return to a political complacency that derives from like total trust and confidence in the person that's in power? Or is it healthy? And are those people who are coming out now as they were once covert, I mean, are now over, is it really that different from what they actually are in general, or what America is in general? When, when we're thinking about these two politicians? Well, one thing I would say is that the majority of America is not really, they're not even being covert. They just don't realize that they're living a system that is designed to take advantage of black people. It's not, they're not being racist. They don't have a racist bone. They don't believe they are racist. But guess what they do? They go, and even we do it. We, we you know, um, one of my fights is against fast food, okay? And you'd say, well, what does that have to do? Most of the fast food is located in black neighborhoods. Why is that? Because of, you know what, we don't, we don't have the, the people in power or we're working too hard to ever to really care that this fast food is in our, um, in our neighborhoods and not in other neighborhoods. Cambridge has, a, has an ordinance that does not allow fast food in Cambridge. So if you really think about it, the only one I can really think about, not talking about, um, you know, uh, is that McDonald's across the street from the clubs on Mass Ave, if you know the area well. So, the, so it is sometimes you don't know what it is that you're doing and that's where they are because this was done. The real people that did this racism, that started this racism that you're talking about now, that was in 19, like 20 and 30s when they started writing the Jim Crow laws the South was completely poor after slavery was abolished, and they started, um, and 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 then they just they decided to do the, the New Deal, which was the most socialist. That's the funny thing about them. They all say that it's the most socialist program ever, is the Green New Deal and the GI Bill. We go into that later. But bottom line, they just gave away houses for free, which started the redlining and they designed their maps and everything. So everybody's living in these worlds that they don't really know. So if you ask me which one is better, the covert or the overt, covert is not, a, it's not, it's also not uniform because the covert, there are a lot of people and they're just rich. I come from Nigeria, a lot of rich Nigerian people. They are so spoiled. They, 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 you know, they just, and the way they're talking about the protesters now being hoodlums, I'm like, hey, Jesus, see Republicans. I didn't know that they were my friends, but they're, it's not really about, so it doesn't even go in, a, in an economic society. I don't even think it goes towards left and right. It may have to do with haves and have nots. And if I have it, I'm not trying to give it up. So um, when I, when I say which one is better, I'd still say that where we're, because I think somebody said it earlier about how we um, have to, you know, not discount people that are, um, you know, so I would go, I'm looking at the coverts. I, I still think the coverts are because you don't know if they're really being secretly racist or they're just oblivious to the fact that, hey, I'm in Harvard, I'm living the good life. I mean, I just didn't realize that there are black people um, 
because these walls, okay, redlining is like, pretend like every ghetto in America has a wall, an invisible wall around it. The wall has two sides. If you're on the other side and the person that built the wall was your great grandparents, you don't know that on the other side what the suffering is going on, right? So I would say for now, let us just focus on, we know who the racists are. <laughs> let us mark them with a big R. And then anybody who's questionable, that is on us. I know it's a lot. We've already done a lot. Do we want to do more, right? To start figuring out. And a lot of African-Americans do not want to figure out. And maybe that falls on people like us that are in the middle that may feel racism, but are not truly hurt by racism, right? Because us Africans, we're not hurt by racism. We, we know there's racism and it happens to us. And what I mean by hurt is that I only have one instance in my life that is hurt. And that's when my mother told me, she was 12 years old. She was born in 1951. So she was being, she was one of the smart ones. These are the heroes, these little heroes, I call them. The little kids they made go to African school, I mean, uh, white schools, right? Kids didn't want to go to white school. They were doing very well in their black schools, right? And when they, was it um, this integration, a, a white man sat on my mom's lap at the age of 12 years old because she was sitting in the wrong area of the bus. Now that hurts me, that, that's the difference. It's not, oh, you know, there's systemic racism and you're talking in platitudes. No, that hurts me. And that black man, that white man, he actually made a mistake because now I'm here fighting for all the black people. <laughs> but the, you know, it's a, it's a source of inspiration. But the point I want to say, so let us focus. We know who the racists are, but let's focus on trying to convert and not really taking a bad intention to every white person that's out there. I think, thank you very much for touching upon that because you brought up something that, like when you reference the wall, right? In terms of the political sphere we're in right now, that wall is an illusion that has been created. I think for a lot of people within the last few months, they've recognized that these walls, they're starting to see what's on the other side and it's making them feel very uncomfortable. And so, for me and my perception of that discomfort is that the urge to vote a certain way versus actually looking at the political the politics or the policies of those two candidates in a very genuine way to see does it really are we trying to restore that wall or that illusion again not just black voters not just african voters but as americans as a whole when you talk about the illusion is being taken off for a lot of white people so in terms of that, that's what I, that's what I'm really referring to. And I'm gonna I'm gonna have Susan ask her question just so that um, we can get things. I'm staying on. I'll stay on after if people want to talk. Yes. Anybody that wants to discuss, because I know there's it's, it, this cannot happen in this little two minute frame. I'm I, I'm bursting at the seams. <laughs> <laughs> right. um, so I'm going to allow Susan to ask her question real quick. Um, Susan? Okay. okay. Yeah. So thank you very much, um, all of you. You've been an inspiration to me as well. You've touched on so many things um, concerning the situation that we are in now. I had a question, but I think uh, it may have been addressed already. I'm not sure. But I want to say that what you have started, continue doing the same thing. Uh, aim high, reach out. When other people invite you, try and uh, respond. You may never know what you might get from um, reaching out to other uh, organizations as well. Um, that being said, um, I wonder if any of you touched on the topics that are going to be on the ballot for this uh, particular uh, 2020 voting. Because um, majority of people think that it's only the presidential election, so it's just two people on the ballot. Um, majority of the questions also uh, plays a role in how um, the electoral college uh, thing win makes whoever win the votes become the next president. What I know is that um, these ballots 
um, or when the next time we are having this kind of discussion, we might like to go in a little bit more, especially when it comes to voting on some of the things that we have to look out for, because some of the questions are very misleading. And if you are not careful or do not really understand what the question is about, then you might make the wrong decision, thereby giving away your power to somebody you do, you do not even want to have your power or something else which is going to be enforced and that might affect you somehow down, down the line. So if people can be more aware of what's on the ballot, what are we voting for? It's not only voting for um, just the um, big ones, you know, the big nominees, but also the little things in our community. Every community has particular things that they are voting for. Like uh, when marijuana passed in Massachusetts, a lot of people think it doesn't concern them. So they go, they don't even take time to read what is written there and then they just shade it and guess what? The next thing you know, it's a law and it affects you. You'll be in your uh, neighborhood and somebody will come and open a shop next down your road. And guess what? You are afraid for your family that some things like this is going to happen to them when you haven't signed up for this. These are the reasons I think people should be voting. But before you vote, you do your homework. And I think next time we should make more um, effort to find out what's on the ballot. Right now they have something like vote for question one. What is question one and what is question two? You know, so these are some things that I'm, I'm sure uh, people will appreciate, especially to new uh, voters, like let's say people who have just turned 18 and they can vote or people who have just uh, got their citizenship and they can, uh, they are voting for the first time. These are some of the things I uh, want you to address. Maybe right now it's okay, but if you have the opportunity and you can talk to other people, please go ahead and talk. Because if you vote for question one, if you vote yes on question one, guess what? They said you are um, helping the local um, vehicle, uh, you know, uh, workshops. If you vote no, you are denying them, so they won't have jobs. But who owns these businesses? And then why would you vote yes or no? Vote no on question two also says the same thing. So we should do our homework as well when we want to do these things. It's not too late. A hundred people's mind that can be changed or educated will go a long way into making a decision in this uh, race as well. So this is all I have to add. And thank you so very much for your inputs. Um, I wish I could do more, but God willing, we will do it again. Appreciate it. I'm with the Ghana Association. Um, of Greater New England, I, I mean, then Association of Greater Boston. Thank you. That was a wonderful question. Thank you for asking it. <laughs> uh, and I'll just I'll just touch on that really really quickly. Um, what that point is so important um, because at at the end of the day, just to you know put things in perspective, at the end of the day, when you drive and there's a pothole. You know, <laughs> that pothole has to get fixed by someone. Exactly. And it's also nice when a councilman or a councilwoman or a mayor or representative lives in the same neighborhood as you and also has their suspension and shocks broken by that same pothole. Mm -hmm. um, that said, um, we're in a position to select and elect who those folks are. And it's not even enough just to say like, for instance, uh, if it's your Democrat or Republican, it's not even enough. It's who is in that seat. Who's not all Democrats are the same. Not all Republicans are the same, right? There are some like Democrats who don't really aren't as vocal as others. Like we need people who are speaking up and advocating for us. Um, so, I mean, it, it's tough. Um, it is hard to if you're not plugged in. If you're not in the know, it is hard to know what exactly is going on with these questions and with these propositions. And that's why it's so important that um, our communities are going to, whether it's 
community meetings, whether it's town halls, when you get those flyers that say such and such representative is coming to the community center or coming to the church at this time, like I'm tired or I don't know what this is about or it doesn't concern me. Um, figuring out ways to have representatives from the community be there to know like, hey, you're making decisions for me. We live here too. And if this doesn't happen, we'll vote you out. Um, because if we're not at the table, someone's making decisions for us, whether we're there or not, someone's going to make that decision. And so it's up to us. It has to be on us to go seek out that information and figure it out because we'll seek out information for other things. We'll seek it out. This is about how to get money, how to hustle. We'll, we, African, we'll find it. Um, and this is that, this is just as important. This is so important. So um, it's tough. I wish there were an easy way to, and there are different apps and um, different folks online who try to explain these things, different political bloggers and locally, but at the same time, it's up to each and every one of us to like, just like you said, just to know what is on that ballot. Um, and when folks, and you know, other people that don't understand it, like, Hey, I'll break it down to you. Or really, I don't know, but I know this guy named Marlon, he has all the answers. So let me point you to him and you can go figure it out that way. Right. Um, yeah. Thank you all so much. Yeah. No, I did not. <laughs> I, I stole a lot of answers along the way. That's, that's what you should do. Yeah. <laughs> all right, everyone. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists. Thank you to our host, um, to all of our guests, our attendees, everyone who's tuning in on Facebook as well for being here, for engaging in this conversation. And um, let's continue it. Let's you know, continue to do the work for our families, for our children, for our loved ones back home. And, um, you know, it's been a wonderful honor to be your moderator for this evening. Thank you all so much. Thank you, appreciate it. I thought that.